What I've been asked to talk about is minimally invasive spine surgery, so it's more of a technique talk, and I just want to give you the flavor of what this all means. So the first point is, what is minimally invasive spinal surgery? Well, minimally invasive always sounds great, but really it's uh, doing the same thing an open procedure is trying to accomplish through smaller holes, smaller incisions, smaller disruption to the surrounding, surrounding tissues. That being said, you know, back problems are ubiquitous. It's a big market out there, and a lot of people want a part of that market share, including me. But the reality is, there are things that are maybe not very effective, but sound great, like laser spine surgery or some of the other techniques that are touted as minimally invasive, but maybe you want to make sure that minimally invasive doesn't mean minimally effective. So many of these procedures I'm going to talk about are also done open to good effect, but I think that we're trying to push the envelope, but we have to make sure we do the outcome research and the self-evaluation to make sure we're doing patients a good service. But the applications of minimally invasive spinal surgery, I mean, they're numerous and always growing every day. And it goes everywhere from these compression fractures that we see very, very commonly to now deformity, which has really been pushing the envelope usually, uh, recently for minimally invasive spine surgery. And so with these compression fractures, these are very common problems that really plague the elderly and cause them to be bedridden. And we used to just say, listen, just stay in bed until it stops hurting. The problem with that is the associated morbidity with staying in bed. They call this the spiral of morbidity where patients are develop urinary tract infections, pulmonary compromise, decubiti, and it has a very high mortality as a result. And so what we've been trying to do is treat these patients more aggressively. So not just the bed rest, narcotics and bracing, but actually do procedures. And one of the such procedures that's been done for quite a while is vertebroplasty, which was recently in the news after a study showed that maybe it's not as good as placebo. And the funny thing about the study, it was a very small cohort of patients that were looked at. And what they did is they said, we're going to take you down, do this procedure, and either they stuck a needle in you or they pressed on the back. And each person had some benefit right after that procedure, whether it was a press on the back or the needle. But what was interesting is that the, the trend was in that small cohort that vertebroplasty did much better. And the trend also was that the people who just had the press on the back ended up doing the vertebroplasty after three months. So kyphoplasty is a different procedure, and that's one I prefer. Um, but what it is is basically putting cement in an area of fracture. So you can see the one, two, three of the steps of this procedure is you're actually putting a, a needle into the fracture percutaneously under fluoroscopic guidance. And then that needle is followed by a balloon. You put that balloon down into the fracture, you create a cavity. And why it's called kyphoplasty is because these patients often have kyphosis. They're bent over from this compression fracture. And by inflating or jacking up that vertebral body, you're ideally correcting that kyphosis. I'm not as concerned about that as I am making a, a cavity for me to deliver the cement in. So I don't just squish the cement in under high pressure and that cement could leak out into the nerves or surrounding tissues. What I want to make sure is I create a cavity for which I can deliver the cement in safely. So I insert the balloon, take the balloon out, and then under low pressure, introduce the cement under fluoroscopic guidance. And you see the, the cement intercalating into the vertebral body, grabbing onto the loose fragments and holding it there. People have a dramatic improvement in the pain, are able to walk out of the hospital when they've been bedridden. And my, my indications for doing this procedure, I think that not everyone with a compression fracture needs these procedures, but I think that if you come to the hospital because of a compression fracture and are admitted because of intractable pain, or you have pain that is not going away or getting worse over a period of four weeks, I think that this procedure is for you. I think that this is a wonderful, wonderful procedure, but it has to be done and worked up properly before you do the procedure. You have to do an x-ray, demonstrate the fracture, but is the fracture old or new? What we do is to determine that is we do an MRI or a bone scan. So you can see here in the middle scan, the bone scan lights up where the compression fracture is, and you can see now on the other um, film on the right, you have cement, which is radio opaque, so it means you can see it on the x-ray, introducing the fracture. The fracture is higher. The patient was able to walk right out of the hospital, right, really right after the procedure. But let's see, that, that, that's been done in very good success with these percutaneous procedures. But what we're doing is now pushing the envelope, doing more and more spine surgery in a minimally invasive way, treating things that uh, Dr. Heffler is talking about, like back pain or leg pain through minimally invasive approaches, where you have nerve compression syndromes from disc, or arthritis, so the cervical disc giving you arm pain, 
or in the lumbar uh, region giving you leg pain or back pain or spinal stenosis giving you what's called neurogenic claudication. These people who have a difficult time walking in distance because they're in such agony and they have to walk stooped over often with a shopping cart, that, that classic shopping cart time. Say, Doc, you know, I could walk in the A&P forever, but you know, as soon as I leave with the bags, I'm in trouble. So those are the people that we can treat very safely and effectively. Now, the traditional approaches are very good for these, where you do a, you know, a, you know, anywhere from an inch and a half for the discectomies to you know, six, inch, inch, six inch incision for the laminectomies to go in there, strip the muscle off the spine, take the, um, mus the, the muscle that's overlying any of the interspinous areas, the ligament and the bone away from the n nerves, decompressing the nerves, and people have a good recovery. It's painful, but they have a good recovery. Some of the people who have um, certainly a lot more blood loss from this older technique, um, the recovery is a little difficult because it's a quite a bit of muscle damage that can ensue. And that muscle damage sometimes is long lasting. And they've done quite a number of studies looking at retractor injuries. The retractors, these, these sort of uh, medieval type of devices are what holds the muscle away from the spine. And prolonged ischemia, oxygen deprivation can ensue in the muscles causing short and long term loss of muscle strength and increased scar and uh, lack of endurance. You've look, looked at EMGs, repetitive testing, histological studies, that's all been very well documented. So how do we do this without stripping all the muscle away, holding it there, putting the muscle under a lot of stress? Well, we do these minimally invasive techniques and the, one of the first ways we've done these pinched nerve techniques is using this tubular system. Basically dilating away the muscle, not cutting it, but just dilating it away by introducing a small, um, really, needle, passing a small dilator over that needle and then sequentially dilating away the muscle until you can put a little tube in there secured by this flexible arm you see. And then you're able to work through that. It certainly has a significant learning curve and we've been doing this for quite a long time and I can tell you that you know, we, you know, it does take a while when you first do this to, to get the hang of it. But once you get the hang of it, it's very easily uh, done and you can get the same kind of exposure. You can see clearly we have excellent exposure of the neural elements. This nerve sac and the um, exiting nerve root are very clearly seen and really you lack for nothing in terms of exposure. And you can easily work with two instruments in there and sometimes even more. Then so we branched out from looking at the, um, the discectomies to doing some more um, extensive decompressions, not just taking the disc out, but treating people with lumbar stenosis, because the problem with lumbar stenosis is more central. It's not moving the nerve side, taking disc out. You have to ha actually have to do both sides of the spinal canal, widening it up. That was before what's called stenotic or very narrow. So we're able to basically go from one side, decompress one side, and then wand this tube over and completely decompress the other side while maintaining the integrity of the ligaments and bony structures that are above it. So we're just sort of sneaking in and undercutting the bone, removing the ligament underneath it, but relieving those interspinous ligaments, this, the ligaments that are attached to the back of the spine, intact. Some of these people with open laminectomies do have instability, meaning that all of a sudden you take some of these supporting structures away and later in life they can have uh, instability and slips, a spine that's too loose causing significant back pain. It's a difficult problem that needs to be addressed surgically with fusions. And you can imagine you take someone in their 70s or, or, or even 80s and do a laminectomy and then their 90s they develop instability. That's nothing you're going to take to the operating room for a big surgery. So it's a very difficult problem. So this is trying to get away from that. Um, you can also, we've also done this in the neck where you're actually able to decompress the nerve from behind without doing a big incision. If you grab your neck, there's a lot of muscle in the back. It's, it, it hurts quite a bit for those open procedures. But this is now an outpatient outpatient procedure where previously people would be staying in the hospital for two, three days. And so the pros are obvious. Less blood loss, faster recovery, less post-op pain, shorter length of stay. There's a longer surgical time as you um, begin this. But as you start to get more facile with these techniques, the surgical time really is the same. I think that we're doing multi-level laminectomies now minimally invasively in about the same time as do open. And you can see now, we can now branch off into other avenues such as fusions where we're actually taking people who have lumbar instability or what's called spinal athesis, a slip in their back. And without making these, you know, seven, eight inch long incisions, we're going in there percutaneously. You can see the guide wires there that we now introduce screws down. And we have this, what's called a sextant device, this, again, 
medieval but minimally invasively so, a uh, device where we actually swing this arm through a second stab incision to link these two screws together so you have a rod and two screws all done percutaneously to hold the spine in um, close apposition to allow the fusion to take place. And we're really pushing the envelope now with doing a deformity correction. You know, if you've ever seen anyone who've had to do, undergo deformity correction for scoliosis, that is a surgery that extends this incision from the base of your neck down to the small of your back. Extensive muscular dissection. And who do we do scoliosis surgery on? Adolescents, often women, often girls. And you know, the scar is one of the first things they always ask about. So we do these in select patients where we can do, go anterior through the, through the chest actually. And we actually have to deflate the lung on one side, but you go through the chest in portals right under where the um, girl's arm will rest. And you're able to get a wonderful correction that way in a select population. And here's a video showing of actually holding the lung back, doing the discectomies, placing the screws all percutaneously and thoroscopically. And you can see now, you can see the camera showing you the, the screws in place. And one by one, we're able to cinch down the screws to a rod and then compress on that rod to affect the, def the deformity correction. So here we're compressing on the rod. I'm going to start tightening the screw. And so hopefully this video will provide enough blood and guts for uh, making up for Frank's cartoon that he had <laughs> earlier. And now you can see the, the um, pleura there. And we're reattaching the pleura. Another new advance in deformity correction is what's called stapling. Now this is a very controversial topic that for a while was looked at with uh, quite a bit of suspicion but is now gaining uh, quite a bit of um, notoriety. What you're doing is trying to do fusionless correction for spinal deformity to avoid these big fusions, that barbaric surgery you just saw. And what you're doing thoroscopically is you're introducing staples, tethering the spine in an area of the curve to allow the, cur the other part of the spine, the other half of the spine, to grow. So you can see on the uh, convexity, by tethering the convexity, you're allowing the concavity of the curve, the, the, the open part of the C, to grow and catch up and actually hold the curve and some cases, in some cases correct the curve. And so again, these can be done under a percutaneous technique that um, is much less disruptive than that other surgery you saw. And certainly, um, avoids even wearing a brace for some of these um, you know, young patients. So you can hear, see us hammering these staples, which, which was initially a, uh, a knee staple, into the spine, capturing the vertebral bodies in either side of that disc space. And this is a memory alloy that as it heats up, it pinces. So that, that pincer effect locks it in place with the heat of the body. So again, what are the conclusions? The bottom of mine is I think that in the right patients with the right surgery, minimally invasive spine surgery has really been a boon to these patients. It's been a wonderful, wonderful asset. Um, again, but minimally invasive has to be just as effective as the o open techniques. And there uh, um, always has to be self-evaluation and, and critical uh, thinking when applying these techniques.